allowed inside this hall. So you can wow. get the key uh, to the hall. <laughs> yeah, now for the next I love it. talk. We have a next talk, Medical Management of Obesity in Day-to-Day -day Practice. She also holds posts in various organizations. The chairpersons for this session are Dr. Rajkumar Chauhan, past civil surgeon and deputy director of health services and currently a practicing physician and Dr. Sadanan Musari, senior reputed nephrologist of Akola. Good morning to all respected delegates and the speakers coming from Pune and Mumbai. Today's topic is Medical Management of Obesity and Day-to-Day -day Practice by Dr. Shaila Sigman. Now, regarding obesity, globally more than 1.9 billion adults are overweight and 650 million are obese. Approximately 2.1 million deaths per annum due to either overweight or obese, secondary to consequence as a diabetes and ischemic heart disease. In India, more than 135 million individuals were affected by the obesity. In India, abdominal obesity is one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. This is very shown that the prevalence of obesity among the women is very significantly higher than the as compared to the men. With this talk, I respect Dr. Shaila Shekharan to start in late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody today? Fine. Great. <laughs> okay. First of all, a very formal and heartfelt thank you to IMA, API, and of course, the uh, Endocrine Society Maharashtra for making me a part of this fantastic meeting. Anita's hospitality and warmth, and Govins and everybody who took, made that effort in the morning, they actually greeted us at the railway station with flowers and some fantastic care that Anita's home. So, heartfelt thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, today, and um, before I start, before I talk anything, I have exactly I think, 20 minutes allotted to me, out of which I am going to ask you all a very important question. How do you all actually view obesity? What is your uh, thought process when you think about obesity? I mean, is it easy to treat? Is it difficult to treat? Is it something we just don't, okay, ha, ah, your obesity can. What, what is it that you actually do in clinical practice when you see a patient whom you would define as like the overweight, obese, whichever criteria you are using. We all the time are talking about this, right? In, I mean, in all meetings, I think obesity has become the new, I would say the new talking point because now we are able to do, we are able to do something about obesity. That's how I would look at it. We have much more to offer to our patients regarding management of obesity. But when you look at obesity, your patient comes to you, comes to you once, says, oh, you tell the patient, you are overweight, you need to do something about it. Come second time, maybe loses some weight, doesn't lose some weight, you again have the same conversation. Third time, you stop having the conversation, you continue with the conversation. Or you are like, okay, this is okay, I am just not going to talk about this any longer. I mean, let's talk about something different, this just doesn't seem to be working at all. Is that what we all go through? I go through it at times, you know, I mean, in a busy practice, I reach a point, I is never going to agree with me on that. But there are times when I'm like, okay, okay, let's not talk about this. There are also times when my patients don't want to talk about it. If I tell my patient, I'm telling my patient, don't you think you're a little overweight? And the patient says, my dear, I've come to you for thyroid. Just talk about the thyroid. Don't talk about anything else. I've heard this from the time, from the last 10 years. I don't want to talk about it. This is something which does happen in clinical practice. And I think what we have somewhere forgotten along the line is that obesity is a disease. It is actually a disease which has to be treated just like you treat hypertension, just like you would treat diabetes. And it is a chronic disease. So we cannot afford to say that, I mean, you know, from morning you've heard about targets, you heard Dr. Shashank Joshi, you heard Nikhil, you heard Vaishali talk about targets, targets, targets. This is what my HbA1 sees. This is what goal is. In obesity, it often happens somewhere, maybe, maybe we forget about those goals because we think that we really done. So we have forgotten it's a chronic disease. And because we forget it's a chronic disease, we invariably stop bothering about it. What happens as a result of that? Of course, I'll talk to you about it in a few minutes. But the most important message which I want to give across today before I even talk about a take-home message, the take-home message right at the beginning is a change in thought process. 
Look at obesity as a chronic disease. Look at it as a relapsing disease. Look at it as a disease which needs constant care, just like you would look at any other disorder in medicine, be it diabetes, be it hypertension, any one of those chronic disorders which you look at. And please understand, it is also social with morbidity and mortality. We often do not look at only obesity being associated with this. We always look at, okay, diabetes, we say hypertension, we will say malignancies, we will say, we will talk about osteoarthritis, we will talk about the mental, the mechanical and the metabolic complications of obesity as separate entities. But we do not really take cognizance about the fact that it is actually the obesity which is leading to all that. And maybe if we keep that in mind, that's where the medical management is going to make a difference because that's when we will realize it's a continuum. It's a continuum of care, it's a continuous process and unless we keep on, keep on understanding that, we will really not get anywhere. Sir has just spoken about these details, I won't go into all this. Sir said that we are having an increased incidence of obesity in the women rather than the men. Number of factors, I won't get into details of that. This is what we conventionally believe. We believe it's very simple. So sweet and simple. You just, in taking more than what you are burning out, and as a result, you develop obesity. Is it that simple? I wish it was. Honestly, I wish it was. If it was that way, it would make your and my life very, very simple. But the fact remains that there are a number of other inputs. The hedonic input, I have just been, uh, I mean, uh, I'm guilty of that today morning. When I went to Anita's home, I got on all the fried stuff she gave me and I came and had, had breakfast over here. Again, a lot of hedonic input today. Just the sheer joy of eating. The sheer palatability. Wow, great food. Let's just eat it. That's hedonic input. My executive center was completely overruled by the hedonic input of fantastic food out there. That's what contributes. There's other, of course, the environmental factors, the sedatoriness, environmental, so psychosocial factors, but what also contributes in a very big way is, as we all know, genetic drivers. So when you look at eating, you realize, or when you look at food, you realize, it's actually controlled by three very, very interesting areas of the brain. And when I talk about interesting areas of the brain, when you, when you know, you often, I mean, you sometimes tell your patients, are you eating to live or are you living to eat? I mean, we often used to hear this as kids, when we are a little more, maybe a little more fighting over food, me and my brother used to always hear to my grandmother, look, I mean, are you eating to live? Are you living to eat? Why are you fighting over food? And that's when you realize that when you're talking about homeostatic eating, you're talking about your GLP-1 and other hormones which increase satiety, and of course your ghrelin which is going to make noise at maybe 12 or 1 p.m. to, to the afternoon, and it's going to increase your hunger. When I already spoke about the hedonic eating, which I was a culprit to, the dopamine and the opioid and the cannabinoid receptors. And of course, behavioral interventions, which we think should make a difference, but we often give up on these behavioral interventions, thinking that, no, I don't think this lifestyle is really making a very big difference. A patient will tell you, Madam, I'm following lifestyle for the last five years. I've gone to all the consultants in the city, and please don't talk to my lifestyle. If you have something more to offer me, you talk to me. Otherwise, I've done it all according to the patient. The psychology I already talked to you about, and I'm going to then talk about medications and surgery and what role they would actually play. The biggest issue about weight loss is that when you weigh, lose weight, you invariably slowly put it back on. Right? Your patient will tell you, I lost weight and then I put it on. I lose weight and then you put it on. And again you put it, no, oh, maybe you just didn't do what was right. Maybe there was something wrong with what you did. I mean, you tried to, oh, maybe you just went for that wedding which did all these issues for you. And when you realize that actually that's not true. I wish it was, but it isn't. What happens is when you lose weight is that you start feeling more hungry. And when you start feeling more hungry, you want to have a lot of energy dense food. You will not go for that lovely watermelon. You're going to go for that those lovely biscuits and all that fried food over there. What, that, what exactly happens is there's a reduction in energy expenditure because of a reduction in metabolism and all this finally is going to again translate into increase in the lost weight 
because there's a reduction in satiety hormones, increase in hunger hormones, reduced nervous system activity, reduced BMI, reduced leptin, and at the end of the day, increased energy efficiency. So next time we blame that patient saying that, no, there's something wrong in what you're doing, we need to understand, no, it's the metabolism which has to be blamed, and we all need to keep on working on it. And when we need to keep on working on it, it's very important that we ask the patient, are you okay with me talking about your weight? It's, we are living in an era where people do get awkward, people do get embarrassed. They were right to decide what they need therapy for. So when you are talking to your patient, you need to be on the same page before you assess, before you advise, before you agree or before you assist. And when you are going to ask, you have to be non-judgmental. Often it happens, and when I say it happens, I include myself in this conversation. But I've still not reached the stage where I can say, hey, I am not judgmental. And often when a patient who comes to your consultation, maybe for the first time, maybe second time, maybe for the end time, you still feel that, oh, you, maybe you just didn't do what you were supposed to do. Maybe you're overweight because you've just not been the right kind, or you've just not followed the right kind of lifestyle. And that is what the conversation is all about. And that is what you transfer to your patient, that kind of negativity that your doctor actually disapproves of you. And that is why you need to change that conversation. You need to talk about BMI, weight, excess weight, unhealthy body weight, unhealthy BMI, yes. But as I said, in a more proactive way. Once you have had this very important conversation about can I talk about your weight, of course you are going to then actually understand as to what, what, I mean, are you going to really talk in terms of obesity only as BMI? We, when we are talking about obesity now, friends, we are moving away from BMI. Or I would say along with BMI, we are doing also the functional classification. And this functional classification, which is a very, very easy classification to, to do the Edmonton Obesity Staging System, which basically classifies three parameters. Your mechanical, your mental, your medical, and your functional classification. And for you, from in this classification, you move from stage zero to stage four. And depending upon which stage your patient is, you would decide what kind of therapy you would choose for your patient. Root cause of weight gain, very important to assess. Because unless you assess what is the root cause, be it genetics, be it medications, is it emotional eating, is it just poor protein intake, or is there something else, you would really not be able to reach target. And if you're not able to find out what is wrong, you definitely cannot chart the road way ahead as to which direction you need to move in. This is an ideal situation. This is what the South Asian perspective has. A lot of friends on this board, and all of them said, eat by the clock. How many people do this in this room? Eat by the clock. Okay, Tejan, I'm not counting you in any of this. I will take Vaishali's vote over here and Anita's vote over here. No skipping of meals, having small frequent meals, oil intake per month, no impairment of quality of life, and ensuring recommended protein intake. I honestly do not do much of this. But this is what you're supposed to do ideally. What happens in the real world is this. Number of diets, number of things available, all kinds of diets. So where do we go from here? Which diet are you going to prescribe? When you're talking about medical management, we all need to talk about what your patient is going to be consuming as far as diet is concerned because without that, you cannot move ahead as far as medical management is concerned. So when you're talking about which diet, are you going to be talking about intermittent fasting? Are you going to be talking about daily calorie restriction? Are you going to be talking about a low-fat diet? Or are you going to be talking about a low-carb diet? What are you going to be talking about to which patient? Intermittent fasting is something we are very familiar with it. I think in our country, our culture, we've been doing it from ages. And if you look at some of the basic ways in which you can sort of more or less decide which patient, what kind of diet would be feasible, when you look at a patient who is apparently healthy, healthy without diabetes, hepatic or renal disorders, no diabetes or pre-diabetes, a person who is having all-time access to food and a grazer, you would think in terms of intermittent fasting. 
Intermittent fasting can be time-restricted fasting. It can be five by two kind of a fasting. There are many forms of intermittent fasting in the interest of time. I won't get into that. But yes, there are some advantages and some disadvantages of intermittent fasting, which most probably we will discuss next time we come to Apollo. The daily caloric restriction is a patient with type 2 diabetes, with established diabetes, and maybe having limited access to food, and a binge eater. So there's some basic ways in which you can decide which kind of diet you're going to prescribe to whom. Now if you look at a low carb versus low fat diet, again in a low patient with diabetes, postpartum hyperglycemia, Vaishali just mentioned hungry all the time, predominant wedge, you would think in terms of a low carb diet. A person with a low fat diet with hypercholesterolemia, not much appetite, predominantly non-vegetarian, SGLE2 inhibitors or ketosis, that's the kind of diet you would think in terms of. When I talk in terms of caloric restriction or macronutrient change, you would again have a patient with good self-control, first time to for weight loss, motivated, yes, you can think in terms of caloric restriction, whereas in a patient who really cannot resist food, during follow-up, not motivated and binge eater, you would think in terms of macronutrient change. Meal replacement therapy, I do use in clinical practice for the sheer convenience, for the ease, and it does help my patients stick to a certain regimen. Though not easy, there is a certain cost involved, and the palatability does become a very big issue after a few days or months. But yes, you can do it partially, you can do it completely, because as I said, it gives you adequate micronutrient cover with good protein content and very, very easy to use but cost and we really do not have too much of follow-up data because to get a patient to actually continue that becomes a little bit of an issue. Exercise, we all know about this, so I won't get into the details of this in the interest of time. So which patients are you going to treat with medicine? In the beginning I mentioned chronic disease, relapsing disease, patients at some point of time could potentially need medical help. And what do we have? Conventionally, actually, even now, what we actually use for obesity as anti-obesity medication in clinical practice was most probably we use Orlistat and we're using Liraglutide. CMA 2.4 is not at this point of time available in the Indian market, but we do have a lot of data regarding CMA, which I will talk to you over the next few minutes. But what we use in clinical practice is basically Orlistat. We know this to be a, a lipase inhibitor and reduces absorption of MG and FFAs. The biggest issue with, with early status, it does not give you the kind of weight loss you or your patient desire. The other biggest problem with early status, it causes a lot of excretion of fat in stools and as a result of that, there's a lot of discomfort. It does call abnormal discomfort, bloating. With a dose of 120 milligram thrice a day with meals, it is not a very comfortable drug to use. And because it does not give the kind of benefit patients expect from it, it is a drug which invariably patients do tend to discontinue. Though 60 mg is actually available as an OTC product. It's 120 mg which is a prescription molecule, but 60 mg is available as an OTC product. But invariably what happens is that patients do not tend to continue with the molecule. So the basic premise where we say that you need to continue the drug for benefit does not actually happen with early stat. As I said, this is a, you would only not use with chronic malabsorption, cholestasis and hypersensitivity. The other medical drug which you could potentially use would be your fentamine, topiramate, which is indirectly reducing your AGR, NPY expression, appetite suppression as a result of fentamine which stimulates norad and dopamine release. And what actually you need to keep in mind is and patients with hypertension or antihypertensive medications, be careful about hypertension and be observant for acute myopia and secondary angle closure glaucoma and of course discontinue treatment if any kind of suicidal behavior is seen. We do not have this combination available in our market, but these are some of the doses which you can potentially use. Nitroxone, Rupiopion, again a drug which acts on the central nervous system reduces appetite, increases energy expenditure, translates into weight loss, acts on the hypothalamic melanocortic system and the reward system pathway. 
What I will go into details a little bit is about the GLP-1 receptor agonists as anti-obesity medications because they are now available to us. Clinically, we were using Lira in 3 milligrams per day as anti-obesity medication. We have been using it. We have been using it very extensively, especially in our patients post-paratic surgery when they have weight regain, to be very honest. And it did give us quite reasonable results. Because 3 milligram again was a little, our most, most biggest problem becomes the cost of the molecule. That's what we faced in clinical practice. Because of the cost of the molecule, again patients would lose weight but would stop the molecule because of the cost of the molecule. Because as I said, we still do not look at obesity as a chronic disease. And because we don't look at obesity as a chronic disease, the patient, for example, may lose 5 kg and it doesn't lose further any further weight loss, stops the molecule saying, ma'am, it's not working. But actually, for maintenance of that weight loss also, you need to continue the molecule, and that's what we very need to change our thought process. Lira 3 milligram, as far as the scale trials were concerned, scale trials, it did show a significant weight loss of 6.2%, and coming to SEMA, which you know, Vaishali was just alluding to, as we all know, the basic mechanism by which SEMA acts is direct activation of the hindbrain, direct activation of the hypothalamus, and all this translates into reduced appetite, cravings, other metabolic effects, and finally this is going to result in reduced energy intake and weight. Very, very interesting trial programs. The reason I'm saying very, very interesting trial programs is because Amaya and me were discussing last night in the train, where Amaya said, and do you think bariatric surgery is going to become obsolete with the advent of newer molecules? Maybe at some point of time, yes, a very, very strong possibility that we could have molecules which could actually work like a medical bariatric surgery. And if you look at all this data across the board, what do you see? What you see, friends, is a remarkable average almost 17% weight loss. Mind you, you need 5% weight loss for metabolic benefit. Only 5% weight loss for metabolic benefit. The additional weight loss is going to translate into benefit definitely as far as the other parameters are concerned. But even 5% weight loss is good weight loss for us. So when you're talking about a 15% weight loss with a drug, definitely you're talking about good weight loss. This is a very interesting you know, slide. And the reason I'm saying it's a very interesting slide is because you would wonder what this grey line is all about. This was the control group, lost weight, but when you stop SEMA, again puts the, all the weight back on. And that's the reason why we need to continue medication, continue lifestyle, so that weight loss can sustain, so that the other benefits that you get with weight loss, be it your dysglycemia, be it cardiovascular risk factors, be it all your other parameters do improve. We all know the Side effect profile is mainly GI related. So yes, nausea, diarrhea, there can be a number of side effects and like, I mean, the entire group of GLP-1 receptor analogs, there would be some patients who would simply not tolerate the molecule at any point of time. Tisipatide, the new kid on the block, very, very impressive data, giving you almost 20% weight loss. That is great weight loss. Side effect profile is again similar. Again, at this point of time, not available with us, but launched in the US market, and a lot of excitement again around this molecule. The last slide in the interest of time, we need to be aware that obesity needs a continuum of care, be it lifestyle, which includes diet and exercise, or we need pharmacotherapy, or we think in terms of bariatric surgery, but at all points of time, we need to consider it as a disease, which needs constant care so that you are actually be going to be able to, if not reverse the complete obesity epidemic, scary numbers, at least stem it to a significant extent so that you can actually reduce or reverse some of the comorbidities and complications related to obesity. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Madam, for that excellent and enlightening vibrant and lively lecture, all will agree with me. And the topic is very relevant, uh, especially in this uh, season of healthy season and 
obesity, the society taking more towards the gym and the self-proclaimed trainers than the doctors. So, I, in one of time, I would just open the floor for a single question if anybody has one. Is a non-diabetic patient. They are except for beta and alpha cells. The chances of hypoglycemia. No, sir. There is no insulin. Sorry, it's not a medical question. But below you, the first rule of the Canadian obesity guidelines, the first thing is ask if the patient wants to talk about weight loss. So just a couple of days, I tweeted about this uh, in response to somebody's tweet uh, that we, we need to ask if the person is ready in that consultation to talk about their weight. And I was, um, uh, there was a huge backlash and most doctors were very offended that we need to ask the patient whether they want to discuss their weight or not. But the fact of the matter is that whenever an obese patient goes to anybody, be it a dentist, physiotherapist, anybody, they all get a lecture on their weight, whether they want it or not. So what is your comment on that? I totally agree with you, Tejan. Uh, I think uh, we definitely need to ask our patients. It is a sensitive issue and we often, you know, are very, very dogmatic about our impressions. And because we are so dogmatic about, because we, when you look at obesity, we, we actually associate with laziness, you know. We associate with somebody who's lazy, who's I mean, and you sort of reiterate that message when you don't, the, I mean, when you just tell the patient, oh God, you're overweight, why don't you do something about this? That's the first statement you most probably make when you walk, when the patient walks into the consultation. And I think that itself sets the entire consultation, that the patient is not in a receptive frame of mind to really listen to what you are saying next. And that sets the ground for a very, very bad doctor-patient relationship right at the beginning. And I think that really sucks, to be honest. So thank you for saying that. So basically, you assume that they haven't done anything about it. And by the time they reach an endocrinologist, as you said, they've been to every nutritionist in the city, they've tried everything, and finally they've come to you. So we assume that one, they don't know that they're overweight, two, that they're not serious about it, or they don't understand the implications, and three, that they've, they've not done anything about it. Thank you. Totally agree with you. Thank you. I, uh, I request the faculty and chairpersons to be exposed to the center for the presentation. I'm a pediatrician, so I always, whenever I talk to the parents about the child being obese, they will always directly direct to the child. They go to the doctor, go to the chips, they go to the What I want to make an important here, um, this thing is that obesity is now a family issue. If the parents will you know unless something they divide their salary plate into four, obesity is never going to work. We look uh, directly towards the child or the other side. So the whole family has to work for us. The parent told the child, we did a study in 20 schools, I mean 20 schools in South Mumbai. And in the 20 schools in South Mumbai, when we told parents whose children were overweight, that we think the child is a little more healthy than the child should be, some parents were offended. Madam, you said that my child is healthy, he is healthy, he is healthy, he is healthy, he is healthy. I mean, we actually face it, you won't believe it. We face situations like this in the camps, where they were like, actually got very very upset about the fact that we said that and that was in very pleasant language like you know we said it in absolutely keeping all kinds of communication skills in mind and don't you think that your child is looking a little healthier than oh madam khatu bhi de ghar ka bachcha itna to khai na ma bada paisa hoi na and the stories i can actually sometimes maybe i can share it to teja that she can write a blog i'm not good at writing so she will definitely write a blog all that you know what we heard so it's a very the parent the dynamics are very difficult. I marvel at, I mean, hats off to all the pediatricians, honestly. I think we should stop using that term healthy for us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so I would like to have a comment over here that uh, most of the time I have realized, and rather through my own experience as a parent, that children do not learn what we tell them, they learn what they see. So we just inculcate healthy habits in our whole family. It is not just for it to chips they have, to eat they have, or under that they will be using Netflix with uh, some something on our plate. So it is just children learn what they see, not what we tell them.
I request the chairpersons to felicitate the Professor Mekendi. I request Dr. Shripa Dadnaikar and Dr. Mohammad Aslam to please come and felicitate the chairperson. Please come. And Thank you. 